Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kata Beilin, faculty director of Latin American, Iberian, and Caribbean studies at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. And I would like to uh, say thank you for joining us today for uh, one more panel in our migration webinar series, which has been prepared by Latin American, Iberian, and Caribbean studies program at UW Medicine together with Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at the University of Wisconsin uh, in Milwaukee. And uh, this panel has been prepared and organized by Professor Michael Light. Uh, Michael Light is an Associate Professor of Sociology and Chicano Latino Studies at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. He holds a PhD in Sociology, but an MA and in criminology, both from Penn State University. Um, and um, his research focuses on immigration, crime, and punishment. We have heard during the recent webinars uh, how much suffering the um, law, current law, has been causing to the immigrants. So today we'll have a chance to hear about possibilities of transforming these legal frameworks. Before I pass the voice to Michael, I would like to thank our sponsors, Latin American, Caribbean and Iberian Studies Program, IRIS, International and uh, Regional um, in International Studies, Institute for Regional and International Studies, um, Center for Latin American um, and Caribbean Studies at the University of Wisconsin and in Milwaukee, and in particular steering committees and faculty members uh, um, who helped to prepare the migration webinar. Uh, in particular, um, I would like to thank today our panelists uh, and uh, M who helped us with uh, all uh, technological preparations. So without further ado, I uh, pass the voice to Michael and our panelists. Okay, well, thank you so much, Kata, for uh, uh, one, thank you for being the, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the general organizer for this conference. I'm sure at times it felt like uh, herding cats, but I, I know it's been difficult uh, switching this from an in-person conference to an online webinar. So again, thank you so much. Um, Cause I'm really excited about uh, the panel that we're gonna have today. So uh, let me say also thank you to everyone who is here or who is you know, trickling in now. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm really, really excited about uh, the panel that we're gonna go through today. Um, we have a really terrific lineup of scholars and practitioners to discuss uh, the issue of contemporary immigration reform. And I'm excited not only about the depth an experience that uh, our panelists bring, but actually, but the different perspectives that they're offering. So uh, I think as you see, so Jens uh, Krogstad will provide an overview of the current national, uh, the state of current national public opinion on immigration. Uh, Isabel Anadon will focus on the impact and the efficacy of subnational immigration policies and laws, including at the state and local levels. And Aisa Alaveras will provide a more on the ground view of the shifts in practices in immigration court over the past few years. And I think combined, they really offer a very rich, holistic, and nuanced understanding of contemporary immigration reforms. And I'm very much looking forward to the conversation today, as I'm sure many of you are. So um, I think we'll begin with uh, Jens today. So I actually sort of was hoping to organize it in exactly that um, order because it does lend itself to this really nice organization where Jens is talking from the more sort of, you know, for the higher level and then Isabel and then uh, uh, we get sort of closer to uh, on the ground with Aisa. And so um, I'm going to introduce Jens first. Jens is a graduate of the University of Minnesota. We'll forgive him for that. Um, and is now a senior writer and editor at the Pew Research Center. He has authored literally hundreds of uh, Pew reports uh, on topics such as global migration, Latino public opinion, Hispanic demographic trends, and US border enforcement. Uh, I am constantly citing his work in my own, uh, so I'm delighted to have him here for this discussion. Uh, today, he will be discussing current trends in public opinion on immigrants and immigration policy. 
I know Jens will talk a little bit about the Pew. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it already. Um, but for those of you who aren't, Pew is uh, absolutely one of the best organizations uh, for public opinion uh, data on these issues. Um, so really, really doing some great work. And I know Jens is at the fore of much of that. So uh, yeah, with, with, with that introduction, please, Jens. Wow, th thanks, Mike. Thanks for that really nice introduction. I'll, I have a PowerPoint presentation where I'll talk briefly about immigration trends, immigration population trends in the United States. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of our survey findings where, uh, where we ask Americans what they think about immigrants uh, and also what they think about various immigration policies. So I will share my screen here. It's my first time doing this with Zoom, so hopefully, does that look okay? I think it. Yep, we can we can see it fine. Thanks, Jens. Okay, great. Okay. So just really briefly about the Pew Research Center, we're a nonprofit. We call ourselves a, a fact tank, and we do a variety of research into issues that are being discussed today. Um, like Mike mentioned, I focus a lot of my efforts on Latino population trends and, and Latino opinion surveys, but also a uh, variety of demographic trends um, uh, related to different racial and ethnic groups. Um, yeah, I think that's probably enough about that. I will jump right into some of the data we have. I'll start with demographics. The US foreign born population um, is at about 45 million uh, today. It was 45 million in 2018, and it's been relatively steady in recent years. Um, prior projections, which uh, from several years ago had it reaching up to 78 million by 2065. Um, of course, that depends on immigration policy, which may or may not change in coming years. One big trend about the U.S. immigrant population is that its share of the U.S. population is near record highs. It's, it's nearly 14% of the total U.S. population. And the last time it was that high was around the turn of the 20th century in, in the early 1900s and uh, late 1890s. It had dropped to under 5% in the 60s, uh, just after the Immigrant and National Ad Nationality Act was passed. And immigrants in the United States have a variety of, of legal statuses. Uh, the vast majority of Latinos are here, or I'm sorry, <laughs> the vast majority of immigrants are here lawfully. Uh, more than three in four are lawful immigrants. Uh, unauthorized immigrants, uh, some people call them illegal immigrants, uh, make up 23% of, of the U.S. immigrant population. And here you can see the breakdown between naturalized citizens who are eligible to vote uh, versus those who are lawful permanent residents and also those with temporary visas who are, are temporarily lawful residents. The U.S. immigrant population is changing, uh, and largely that has to do with uh, the changes in the flows from Mexico. Uh, today, Mexican immigrants still make up uh, the largest group uh, of any origin group, and so they are, Mexican immigrants are about one in four of all U.S. immigrants in the United States. There are about 11.2 million uh, Mexican immigrants in this country. Uh, the next biggest, two biggest groups are China and India. They are each a little under 3 million. But if you look at recent arrivals, uh, we see this changing rate of US immigration to the country. We see that among uh, new immigrants each year, uh, a, the, uh, Asian immigrants now are a larger share of new immigrants than Hispanic immigrants. In 2018, 37, percent of new immigrants uh, were Asian and 31 percent were Hispanic. Next, I'll talk briefly about how uh, Americans view immigrants themselves. By and large, we've been seeing a positive trend on this. We, we see 
that two thirds of Americans, of US adults, say immigrants today strengthen the country more than uh, burden the country. Uh, this share has increased uh, over the past decade. Uh, it, it used to be that Americans were more divided on this issue, where roughly half uh, thought immigrants were uh, strengthened the country and about half burdened the country. We've also asked Americans what they think about immigrants and, uh, and jobs. And here again, we see a largely positive attitude toward immigrants, uh, both uh, legal immigrants and also undocumented immigrants. Uh, when we asked Americans overall about whether undocumented immigrants mostly fill jobs that U.S. citizens don't want versus whether they fill jobs that U.S. citizens would like to have, three quarters uh, said that undocumented immigrants fill jobs that uh, U.S. citizens did not want. Uh, they were also largely positive when asked about uh, legal immigrants. Uh, though it was lower than for undocumented immigrants. Um, on legal immigrants, 64% of Americans said legal immigrants mostly fill jobs U.S. citizens do not want. And, and so you see kind of this, uh, this dissonance between a lot of the public conversation we're having about immigrants uh, and toward American attitudes. And, and a lot of this does have to do with, of course, partisan differences. At the bottom of both of, the, uh, of, both of these charts, you can see the, the partisan differences of when, but even so it's notable that even among Republicans, uh, those who identify as Republican or lean toward the Republican party, uh, a majority, about half or more, agree that uh, legal immigrants mostly fill jobs US citizens don't want. And two thirds of Republicans uh, said undocumented immigrants mostly fill jobs US citizens do not want. Uh, so again, overall, even when looking by party, um, Americans are more positive than not on these questions. Next, I'll talk a little bit about how the US views immigration issues. And here we've seen a consistent trend. Since 2001, uh, we've seen a declining share of Americans who say legal immigration should be decreased. And we've seen a rising share who say legal immigration should be increased. Uh, today, 32%, or this was back in 2018, this, this survey, the last time we asked this, it was 32% said legal immigration to the US should be increased and 24% said it should be decreased. However, it's notable that uh, the highest share, 38% said immigration should be kept at present levels. And again, there, there were some pretty notable differences by partisan identification on this. Uh, when when uh, on the decreasing option, the those who think immigration should legal immigration should be decreased, uh, roughly 32, 33 percent of of um, Republicans said it should be decreased, and a lower share, about 12, 13 percent of Democrats said immigration should be decreased, or uh, yeah, decreased. And when we asked about the top issues in 2020 today for the presidential race, uh, we again saw some of these partisan differences, but notably uh, immigration isn't at the top of the list uh, when we asked registered voters about whether each issue is very important to their vote. Each issue in this chart is very impo important to their vote. So by and large, uh, American voters say the economy, healthcare, and Supreme Court appointments are some of the top issues for them. Uh, quite a bit further down the list, about half or 52% say immigration is very important to their vote in the 2020 presidential election. There are some differences by, by party, in this case, by which candidate uh, the respondent supports. 61% uh, Trump supporters say immigration uh, is very important to their vote. 46% of Biden supporters said the same. We've also asked about, this is a question, uh, this is about uh, a path to citizenship, uh, broadly speaking. Three quarters of Americans say undocumented immigrants should be allowed to stay in the US legally if certain requirements are met. So 75% of 
Americans say this, of US adults say this. Again, there are some pretty big differences by party. 89% of Democrats said this, but still a majority of Republicans still said this, even though they are quite a bit more negative on this question. Um, and you also see some of the breakdowns by race and ethnicity. Uh, we also asked a similar question except about DACA. So we, we asked people whether uh, immigrants who were brought to the US illegally as children should be granted a legal status, a permanent legal status. And again, three quarters of Americans, 74% said that, that yes, uh, these immigrants who, who came to the US as children should be granted permanent legal status. Uh, and with similar breaks uh, by partisan identification, 91% uh, Democrats, 54% Republican. Last year, last fall, we asked about a variety of immigration policy goals, uh, whether we should increase security along the US-Mexico border, establish a way for immigrants here illegally to stay legally, to take in refugees escaping from war and violence, and uh, increasing deportations for those in the US illegally. And we found that a majority of, of US adults uh, said that all of these, all four of these were, were important immigration policy goals. Uh, the, but uh, more Americans thought that of uh, increased security along the US-Mexico border and taking in refugees. Uh, and about half said that they thought it was very important to increase deportations of those in the US illegally. And here we see the attitudes Americans have toward these immigration, uh, toward three of these immigration goals from 2016 to 2018. Uh, one interesting trend that we saw here was that the percent of Republicans who thought it was very important to take in refugees escaping from violence and war uh, actually increased from 40% in, in 2016 to 58% in 2019. Uh, and the, yet at the same time, uh, the vast majority of Republicans favored increasing deportations of those in the US illegally. Uh, so, they, so there was this kind of more nuanced story about how Republicans view immigration. Uh, there was a majority of Americans, two third, about two thirds, uh, favored establishing a way for immigrants to stay here, uh, immigrants here illegally to stay legally. Uh, that was up a little bit from 2016, but fairly similar. Um, and so that that is the last slide I have on on that. Um, I'm happy to answer questions uh, whenever whenever it's time to do so. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you so much, Jen. And so my apologies for, uh, um, so yeah, so let me, I should have stipulated um, the plan. So uh, for for both Jen's and um, uh, the rest of our panelists, I think what would be best is if you have, um, feel free to put any questions in the Q&A. Uh, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen that you can click on. Um, and what we'll do is we'll save um uh questions for the q a session and i question type it in there and what i can do is i can and uh sort of throw them to our panelists i think that might be the best way to do it um uh, i will say though is that if there is a question about clarification right so if it's something you know if, if it's if it's a real you know kind of specific question just sort of about you know not sure what the panelists said feel free to put that in the chat and i can maybe flag that um, but if there are more sort of general questions about the presentation, uh, feel free to put that in the Q and A, and we'll uh, we'll deal with those questions at the end. Does that does that sound good, Jens? Yeah, that sounds great. All right, perfect. Well, again, thank you so much uh, for um, again, it's um, it's it's a lot uh, of information, and I guess that Pew is really at the uh, at the fore of this, and so it's it's really uh, uh, you know I'm I'm constantly. Uh, I'm very much uh, paying attention to what's going on at the Pew because I think the Pew is um, often really good in terms of having its pulse on uh, these kinds of issues. So again, I really appreciate uh, you sharing that. Um, so of course, yeah, thank you. Um, so now we're going to sort of move beyond the more sort of national 
level conversation and move to the more subnational conversation. So uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Isabel Anadon. Isabel, excuse me, <clears throat> Isabel is a graduate of Notre Dame and the University of Chicago. And she is currently a candidate, a uh, PhD candidate in sociology here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, doing some really interesting work on immigration generally. Um, but today she's going to be talking about some of her ongoing research on the effects of subnational immigration laws. And I'll let her, um, you know, clarify what that is and, and, and talk about um, exactly what it is she's looking at. So, uh, Isabel, please take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Light. I'm going to share some slides as well. So just give me a moment here to open that up. Let's see this. Um, yeah, we can, we can see it fine. Okay, great. All right, so uh, thank you again so much. I'm really honored to be part of this conversation today, uh, this important conversation on study. I am a PhD candidate at the Department of Sociology here at UW-Madison, and I'm studying uh, migration, punishment, race and ethnicity, and socio-legal studies currently. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of my work and some of my collaborative work um, and um, colleagues' work on um, sub the subnational uh, realm around immigration policies and laws, specifically here in the United States. Um, so here I'm going to be talking a lot about local and federal interactions and programs in place on um, the jurisdictional level, the smaller state and local level, as well as broader state level policies that um, are have been in, put into place to cover an entire state. Uh, I'm going to close with some newer research that I'm currently uh, participating in and working on related to looking at detention center and uh, place level in, uh, analysis of detention centers and just the overall prison uh, proliferation that is currently going on in, in the United States and how we're seeing a lot of similarities between both prisons and detention centers being built currently. So before I kind of go into the meat of my talk, I, I did want to put uh, a little bit of historical context into uh, immigration law and the enforcement of immigration law in the United States. Um, a lot of what I'm drawing on here is from Gula Sekram and Ramakrishnan, I hope I didn't butcher their name, um, their book on the new immigration federalism. Uh, in their work, they highlight about three main periods of immigration federalism in the United States. And this little graphic here to the bottom right of the scale gives you a good idea of kind of this balance that is being played out in the United States over time of states and localities weighing down a little bit more in their role around immigration enforcement. And then, you know, the federal unitary state coming in and, and, and putting in their, their stamp on how uh, immigration should be happening in the country. Um, so the first stage, the first um, era here deemed by Newman is this law century in immigration law covers a period of like 1776 to 1875. And this time really points to um, the federal government maintaining a relatively quiet stance on matters of immigration. And although in the Constitution in Article 1, Section 8, there it's clear that Congress enacts a uniform role of naturalization, during this time, state and localities were really the primary regulators of immigration. Uh, scholars have pointed to reasons why this is the case, and I think some of the most salient ones is pointing to uh, slavery during the time. So that meaning that um, slavery, um, the control and the, the prominence of slavery during this century really pushed back um, notions of developing any type of immigration reform on the national level because it was kind of seen as a signal to eliminate, um, you know, addressing uh, immigrate, uh, slavery within the freedom of black migrants at the time. Um, so that, so that was a really a period of, you know, again, where like federalism, states and localities really had their teeth into, into immigration law. Um, and then 1875 to 1965 is like the second era uh, in, in their work. And this, this is really where we start to see a rise in importance of immigration, the federal uh, government's role in immigration law. Um, so we do see a lot of Supreme Court cases coming out, like knocking down, rejecting um, 
states being able to enact any type of immigration uh, rules in their in their um, in their locality. So, for example, Klang and Freeman in 1875 ruled a federal exclusivity in the field of immigration. Uh, uh, be striking down California's law that was trying to allow state commissioners to um, enact some type of bonds on certain arriving immigrants. Um, and so this, um, this federal exclusivity rose after slavery ended and the Civil War ended. Uh, in 1882, we see the first, but many scholars have deemed the first uh, the nation's first immigration law, the Chinese Exclusion Act, that really put in place um, the exclusion of certain um, Chinese immigrants at the time. And um, if, you know, I'm not going to go into a, a huge amount of this history, but if you're interested, I can definitely point you to some good resources on it. But it was, there, there was a lot of Supreme Court rulings and lower court rulings, as well as Congress, really limiting the state and localities role in involving themselves in immigration. Um, and so you kind of see that scale to the back, right, to the unitary state during this time. Um, this third area of immigration that the new, federalist, the new federal immigration theory posits is a third era around post 1965. And this kind of aligns with, you know, the changing of um, the demographic and uh, nativity composition of immigrants arriving at the time, you know, away from the European, Russian and native nativities to Latin American and Asian immigrants that really rose post-1965. Here we also have the passage of the Hart Seller Act during the middle of the civil rights movement that um, struck down a lot of the quota-based uh, immigration rules that were in place since the 1925 that many folks uh, pointed to as being uh, racist and, and um, exclusionary. Um, so now what we're seeing here and what I'll be talking about in most of my the rest of the talk is this new century around immigration law and kind of what I'm pointing to is like uh, mid to late 1990s. Um, and here, um, uh, Gulas Karam and Ramakrishna have, have really start, um, discussed this as kind of a striking resurgence of subnational immigration law. So again, the federalism swinging back down to having a little bit more power in regulating immigration within the states. Um, and localities and um, really kind of a defiance of this past legal precedent that we found in the centuries before around, um, you know, the, the federal government met, uh, regulated immigration. So, yeah, so what I'm talking about now is, um, again, from 19, about mid 1990s. So one of the kind of the first high profile and contentious um, rise of subnational laws, as I'm sure most folks are aware of, was the referendum, the California's Prop 184, that um, went on the voters ballot in 1994. This prop proposition sought to um, limit the access of public benefits for undocumented immigrants. It was very uh, popular and garnered uh, nearly 6 million votes, which is about 72% of the voters at the time. However, um, a lower federal district court deemed it um, unconstitutional, primarily due to some of these federal preemption uh, issues that were in place, as I've discussed before. Um, however, it really left kind of a stark message to current and future migrants of kind of the, the states and localities role in, in how to manage immigration within their jurisdiction. Uh, then two years later, IRA, IRA, the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act was passed, and this was really uh, President uh, Clinton and, and Democrats and Republicans trying to be tough on crime. There was a huge crime um, in resurgence during this time, a lot of violent crime. And so this bill was put into place to kind of um, be responsive to that, amongst other things. Um, but specifically, what this bill did was reduce uh, access to public benefits for both undocumented and also recently arrived, legalized, uh, recently, I'm sorry, recently legalized immigrants. Uh, but it also developed um, new categories, categorical, different categorical crime uh, for immigrants and, and, and um, created, you know, these new categories in place and also made them retroactive. So meaning that, you know, if an immigrant uh, did these crimes, let's say five years prior, this could be brought up, you know, into their case um, in future immigration proceedings or, or, or hearing. Uh, another important piece that was written into the law within IRA, IRA was the 287G cooperation agreements. Um, and the 287G um, were, were programs that were put in place in, in IRA, IRA to provide 
local uh, law enforcement, a, a, a more seamless interaction between local law enforcement officers and the federal government to be immigration enforcers um, in within their localities and be able to um, provide that type of cooperation uh, in, in a more seamless seamless way. 287G has, has been now, uh, for all intents and, pur intents and purposes, has been under, subsumed under secure communities. However, there is some scholarship out there, and again, I can point it to you, that, that, that does find there are regional and place differences of implementation of secure communities in localities, but this is now in place around the country. Um, one other notable thing about 287G, although it was written into law in IRA, IRA there was no actual um, uh, the first agreement, the first formal agreement in place happened in 2002, which was a, a year after 9-11 in Florida. And since then, they, the 287Gs kind of really proliferated and, and kind of grew around the United, United States. Um, and so another, um, I guess, outgrowth of, you know, the uh, lack of immigration, federal immigration reform is these presidential executive orders on immigration. So um, all of us uh, are aware of Obama's 2012 um, DACA program. And um, most recently, the current President Trump has um, done a, a, a lot of executive orders on border security, limiting access to asylum, also reducing the number of visas for uh, certain arriving refugees, and has done a lot of work on um, interior enforcement and uh, promoting local federal immigration enforcement as well. So next, I'm going to turn to kind of some specific local, state, and federal interactions within immigration law. So first, uh, not all of this is terrible, right? There is some good stuff that's happening, uh, specifically the sanctuary movement. This movement was in place in the 19, uh, started around the 1980s uh, here in the United States um, in churches, you know, housing immigrants to um, provide a safe haven for individuals within uh, religious institutions. Uh, and then the sanctuary policy started to proliferate, the first one actually being in the city of Chicago in 1987. Um, and then um, a lot more developed over the, after 2000. There was a, a, a huge um, increase in the number of sanctuary city policies. And again, these can be a range of different um, types of uh, policies and cover different jurisdictions. So here you see on the right, this is actually from the New York Times a couple of years ago that mapped out sanctuary city um, policies and but we see some states here counties um, cities as well so again these are local level initiatives or they are could be within law enforcement agencies themselves um, and they fall under three kind of broad categories here uh, don't ask policies which are policies that restrict government officials from inquiring about a resident's immigration status don't tell policies, which are policies that limit the information and cooperation between federal immigration enforcement officials, and don't enforce policies. So these are policies which limit immigration related arrests and detentions. Um, and so there, you know, not there's no one immigration sanctuary policy, uh, excuse me. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're patchwork. They um, apply to different, different uh, regions as well as different ways and in, in terms of how um, how these protections are being put in place. Um, so this is another great example of local and state and federal interactions. This is actually new data. Um, I'm not sure if it's new, but uh, Professor Light provided this for me uh, to share with you all today. And this is from a project that he's working on related to undocumented immigration, crime and recidivism and evidence from Texas. So what we see here is um, this is data from all criminal cases in the state of Texas from 20, uh, 2006 to 2018, broken up by citizenship status, so US citizen um, as compared to non-US uh, citizen. And these are arrests, so felony arrests in the state that are done by state and local authorities. So uh, interesting, and these are charging decisions. So the, uh, for example, the x-axis, the y-axis is the percent of um, uh, individuals that are uh, charged with a felony. Um, what's stark here is that um, there are about 45,000 arrests for federal charges, and these federal charges can be from a range of different agencies, the U.S. Marshals, to the, the um, Bureau of Prisons, to ICE, uh, Immigrant Customs and Enforcement Agency, um, that place, you know, place like a hold or, or a federal charge on these individuals that are arrested at the state level. 
And um, what we hear is that if you're a U.S. citizen charged only with a state felony, there is very little difference if uh, among the other U.S. that have a felony charge on the federal level compared to non-U.S. citizens who also non-U.S. citizens who have a charge only at the state level are comparable to the U.S. citizens. But, you know, the discrepancy here is with the non-U.S. citizens who have a charge, a federal charge on the uh, federal level, a felony charge on the federal level. And so there's a huge increase here. I think it's all close to 89 percent versus 86, 5 percent. And this is a significant difference. And there are other controlling factors here, including race, gender, age, criminal history, and the severity of the crime. And so we are seeing that there is a significant more likelihood of a non-citizen in Texas to be charged with a federal offense following the arrest than it is with a U.S. citizen. So now I'm going to swing a little bit. You know, I, I'm talking about the state and local interaction with um, federal, and now I kind of want to look at some of my work that looks just at the states and what's the state's role in immigration recently. So stepping back a little bit, this is from the National Council of State Legislators. They uh, run some annual reports on immigration legislation uh, passed every year. So this is just the number of states, uh, I'm sorry, this number of state legislation that's enacted related to immigration and immigrants from 2005 to 2017. And uh, what's again notable here is there is a, a pretty stark increase from about 2005 to 20, 2007. And, you know, these little dips, I think you see here, um, yeah, I, I think these are like, I believe these are election years. So immigration is a very contentious topic in, a, in a, every election year. And so there's definitely less movement. Um, but we see there is a sustained, sustained increase and, and, you know, interest in states enacting uh, legislation related to immigration and immigrants. And this is across the board. These are restrictive bills. These are resolutions. And so it could be positive or negative, but this is just kind of an overall picture of what we're seeing here on states. Oh, and one more thing. The blue lines um, show the study period of, of um, what I'm going to be showing next. So I, I look at about 10 years worth of data and, and that, those are the years that I'm looking at. So I specifically look at uh, omnibus immigration laws, um, and these are laws that um, are passed on the state level that encompass a, a wide range of immigration issues. Um, so before I go into the detail details of what they actually are, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the motivations for passing these laws. Now, these are not um, motivations that I found in the scholarly literature. There is some literature on this, and again, I can point you to some of that work. Um, there are scholars that have looked at the composition of state legislatures as reasons of why these bills are passed to very interesting work on, um, you know, uh, slave holding states or states that have had history with discrimination in the past of being more likely to pass these types of laws. Um, th that's all very interesting and, and I can talk more about that or, or offline we can talk about that, but this is kind of what the rhetoric, rhetoric was during the debates, right? So the primary motivations for passing these laws in states were to one, deter immigrants from settling in the states or self-deportation. So Mitt Romney's famous self-deportation policies during his presidential run making the um, jurisdictions or localities really inhospitable so that immigrants will, or undocumented immigrants will choose even not to sell, settle. Another motivation is um, this idea that immigrants um, increase crime, which has again been proven in the literature time and time again. And actually, uh, Michael Light and I have a paper on this as well, if we can point to you to share with you um, that, you know, this is this is actually not the case and the exact opposite, that immigrants um, reduce crime in many areas. Um, and then another reason is the is limiting the use of state public expenditures, particularly uh, public welfare. So I, I, I framed my study around looking at different indicators for each of these areas. I'm just going to show you data from one of them. So really quickly, omnibus immigration laws, again, during my study period, they passed in 10 states from 2005 to 2014. Since then, I've expanded my study a little bit to include two additional states, both the state of Texas and the state of North Carolina, and uh, it passed bills post-2014. Um, these bills must have been restricted, restrictive in nature, excuse me, so for them to be coded an omnibus law, they had to limit um, some type of provision for uh, immigrants. Um, and specifically, they had to uh, 
touch on the majority of the four points listed here. So increasing law enforcement involvement. So that could mean, um, you know, again, in sh mandating that local law enforcement act as immigration officials, um, reducing access to public services. So this looked, looks like, for example, uh, reducing state benefits or access to state tuition aid or rates for in the case of undocumented students. Um, increasing workplace restrictions, so implementing, requiring businesses in the state to comply with the E-Verify program during this time, and then also enacting penalties for hiring undocumented immigrants. Um, and then a variety of different identification restrictions, so for example, denying the use of consular cards as acceptable forms of identification. Um, another one would be, for example, Arizona in their original tense, Arizona is the the, the, you know, the, the big state that, that kind of hit the national scene when all of this came down in 2010 specifically. But in Arizona, one of the first provisions in their law was to require um, the proof of citizenship status and, and require local law enforcement to check this at every traffic stop. And this was eventually struck down at the, at the courts because of some of this federal preemption um, issue that I just discussed earlier. Um, and so this is the, this is some of the findings. I, my study is interested in the effects of these laws on different populations. So I look at things like mobility as measured by compositional changes of different populations, which is what you see here. I also looked at crime rates and I lo also looked at public expenditures. Um, but I'm just going to talk about this one because it's kind of the most robust that I have fleshed out and currently trying to push out, push out the door. But this is the effect of these laws on the undocumented population as I measured by compositional changes. So what we see here is um, the, the model uh, on the bottom here will show the compositional changes of the undocumented population by state and year and then whether or not the state enacts um, this type of bill in a particular state or year. And then these are my uh, controls, so various economic, demographic, and political policy controls that I put in place. And so um, what I find in my work is that these laws do, although a small effect, they do have an effect on uh, the compositional changes of undocumented population in, in these states relative to states that don't have them. And so the impact of these could be on the you know, economics and other um, um, issues, state issues that, that might, states might be facing. So I, I also looked at the effect of these laws um, after the first year. So my original models kind of did a linear effect, assuming that, um, you know, 0.2% of the undocumented population moves out, you know, does that maintain itself after each year? And so this graph basically shows you that the effect gets larger after every single year, um, after every year of the, of the bill being passed. So um, just to show that this is a, a, a larger effect over time as well. Um, and so now quickly, I just want to talk about some uh, very preliminary research that I'm working on with Professor John Eason in the Department of Sociology and the UW Justice Lab. Um, this work focuses on racial, economic, and health disparities, and it look, does it by critically examining the cause of spatial inequalities. Um, this work is um, focusing on detention center and prison building and kind of looking at um, how detention center and prison building are related and they're not related and kind of some of the spatial in, in inequalities that are resulting as that that are happening as a result of of these places being built and cited in different communities so if th this is the website of justice lab if you're interested in learning more so again these are very descriptive very preliminary findings but um, we have some data on all the prisons and the years that they were built as well as detention centers now detention centers are a little bit more complicated than prisons because detention centers are housed in prisons sometimes, housed in jails sometimes, and standalone entities sometimes. So we're, we're working on parsing some of that data out and, and getting it pretty clear. But what we see here is um, three columns, um, all places, uh, that th th these are just averages of um, all US places in the United States. Um, places with the second column is places with no prisons or detention centers and the last column is places with at least one prison and at least one detention center and we can see the differences here of you know ver various um, demographic and socioeconomic indicators here and so we do see there is more black and hispanic 
populations in places with at least one prison and one detention center. And we also see increased poverty rates as well as higher unemployment rates. Interestingly, we see um, greater percentage of college degree, um, uh, but lower medium household income. So I know sometimes those tables are a little bit, um, you know, not fun to look at. So I um, just pulled out one of those indicators here so that you can see the trend over time. And um, we have this data from 1998, 1990, and 2000. And you'll see this is the percent poverty within with these places. Um, so the top line is places with at least one prison and one detention center as compared to um, the orange line, which is places with no prison or detention center and then all. And that's it. So thank you so much. And if you have questions, I have my email there. And thank you, uh, Professor Light and uh, my other team for helping me with this work. Of course. So uh, thank you very much, Isabel. So that was um, so it was really, really good to hear one. Uh, I, I really appreciated the sort of the scope of your presentation. I think I'm, can you hear me okay? Cause it looks like my video is stalled. Okay, all right. All right, okay. Um, the, um, uh, so I really appreciated the, the scope of your presentations. One, starting with a uh, brief history, talking about sort of how this has evolved, but then also hearing about some of your uh, more recent work um, that's in its nascent stages is always great. Um, oftentimes we're talking about things that are, you know, already you know, well in the works and polished, but it's, all, it's always nice to hear about sort of here is what is sort of currently uh, much for sharing that. And our last uh, panelist is Aisa Olivares. Okay, Aisa is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin, as well as uh, the University of Wisconsin Law School. She is currently the managing attorney at the Community Immigration Law Center here in Madison. And today she will be discussing trends in immigration detention in Wisconsin and the implications that immigration court policies and procedures have had on litigants. So uh, without further ado, I invite Aisa. Thank you so much, Dr. Light, and thank you to Jens and Isabel as well. I think that you ordered us in a really great fashion, Dr. Light, because um, I definitely have a practitioner's perspective. Um, I am on the ground here in Madison, Wisconsin, serving Dane County residents who are at risk of deportation. And so um, what I see as far as trends in immigration detention and in immigration court are definitely from the lens of being on the ground at our local facilities and inside of our local immigration court. So I'm going to share my screen so that everyone can see. Let's see. Here we go. Okay. We can see your slides. Yes, okay, okay thank you. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so as Dr. Light mentioned, I'll discuss detention and um, the trends that we're seeing in um, immigration detention and immigration court. Um, I know that we're talking about reforms and so you'll definitely get to see the way that things have been changing. Um, and I think it lines up really well with the research that Isabel was talking about and also the polls that Jen were, Jens was referring to. Um, and I'll also talk at the end about what we're doing here in Madison to try and influence immigration reform in our immigration courts. I wanted to start with the context of immigration detention. So as we can see, um, immigration detention has grown significantly. This is an average daily number of people who are in detention. In 1994, there was just a little more than 7,000 people. And we're seeing now that there's um, over 45,000 people as in, in immigration detention daily. These are the admissions into ICE facilities since 2004. As individuals are released from detention or as they are deported, um, they, the bed space opens and ICE tends to try and fill it as much as possible. So as you can see, they are, um, those, these numbers on these beds are filled consistently and these, the number of apprehensions have grown. Um, I think I dedicate a lot of this to the possibility that um, 
that things deportations are happening faster lately. Things are moving much quicker and we're going to talk about why we see that. We also have here that there are, um, where are deten detained immigrants from? And I'm sorry about the noise, I'm inside of my office and um, we're particularly busy today. Um, so where are detained immigrants from? Um, we see here um, when we look at the chart that the highest number is Mexico, that is a contiguous country here with the United States. And then we see our Central American countries and we also see Ghana, Haiti, Nigeria, and the Dominican Republic. And so that goes along with what we've talked a lot about, about where is enforcement happening right now? It's definitely happening a lot in our black and brown communities. And those are the individuals um, that, are, that we're seeing in the detention facilities right now. So who is detaining um, the people who are in the detention facilities? You can see that 61% of people who are being detained are by Customs and Border Patrol. Those are individuals um, and apprehensions that are happening um, at our ports of entry at our southern and northern borders. Um, and 38% is by ICE. That's mostly internal enforcement here in the United States. Um, I noted below that um, Central uh, Customs and Border Patrol you know, they have very small facilities. They don't have large detention facilities. Usually they take individuals for a longer stay to a larger facility close by um, because of the small um, area of the facility and people have probably seen in the media um, the harsh conditions that people wait in on the border. Um, those are stays that should not exceed 72 hours, but we know as of mid of last year that the average length of detention in those smaller border patrol facilities exceeded one week. So this is all of the ICE detention locations um, nationally. Um, we know that even if somebody is detained locally here in Wisconsin, for example, that they can be taken anywhere nationally um, in, inside of this network and, and be separated you know, from their family while they are detained until their case is resolved or they're bonded out of detention. There's over 200 facilities. They're both private, as you can see, um, and they're also ICE contracts with county and city facilities. So you can see that here in Wisconsin, and I'll show you a little bit more, um, these are county facilities that ICE contracts with. <clears throat> these are the two facilities here in Wisconsin. Each hold about 200 um, beds for ICE. Uh, most recently, the Kenosha facility um, in Kenosha, Wisconsin, which is very close to um, Illinois. Actually, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the, their sheriff decided that they did not want any more individuals coming into the facility that had to do with ICE. So they basically told ICE, we're not taking anyone else. You know, the people that you have here can stay here, but we're not taking any more individuals. We're not filling any more beds for ICE. Um, and ICE was not happy about that. Um, and so what ended up happening is those individuals that were housed there were taken out by ICE. They transferred them over to the Dodge facility and then people in the Dodge facility were transferred to different places nationally, including as far away as Texas. Um, we, we ourselves as practitioners and um, here at the Community Immigration Law Center had um, clients taken you know, as far away as Southern Illinois, um, nearly eight hours away from where we're located. So um, it was a very difficult in terms of access to justice, being able to access our clients um, during this time and during the, a, a time that was pretty chaotic for the country as we were trying to figure out what was happening with the pandemic and how um, ICE was going to handle it. We as practitioners called for ICE to halt did people um, halt enforcement. Um, we saw it slow down, but certainly it continued and, it, and it's actually picked up over the last 30 days. Um, and so it's, um, I'll talk a little bit more about COVID-19 and detention, but um, it's definitely been a, a difficult time for people in detention. People are especially fearful right now. So there are geographical challenges um, for those individuals that are detained here in the Dodge facility, particularly you can see how far away we are from Chicago. When somebody is 
detained um, and they are going to have their final hearing with immigration. They are actually transported down to Chicago at three in the morning um, so that they can make their hearings um, in Chicago with their, with their attorney. Everything else happens um, via uh, telephone or via video um, until that final hearing when they are um, taken by, by bus. Um, they are shackled the entire time by their ankles and by their wrists while they are being transported down to Chicago um, with other people who have to attend their final court hearings. Chicago also serves individuals, aside from individuals in Wisconsin, um, individuals in Indiana, individuals in Kentucky, and individuals in Illinois. So you can just imagine the number of cases that um, pass through those courts each day. So briefly, I'm gonna to touch on um, immigration detention and COVID-19. Um, I think it's relevant that we speak um, a little bit about this um, because we've seen numbers not, you know, necessarily enforcement has gone down, but we haven't necessarily um, seen our numbers go down because there's not less um, enforcement, sorry. So detention numbers are down, um, but it's not because we're, we're, um, we're not um, executing enforcement. It's not because Department of Homeland Security and ICE has not been busy, but it's because we're not having as many people arrive at our southern border at this time. And that's because essentially we've shut down the border um, to under a, you know, announcing a health emergency and have not allowed any asylum seekers in to seek asylum here in the United States. So um, as we probably know in ICE detention, there's no room for social distancing. Individuals, um, you know, have to shower, eat, exist very close to each other. And the reason that this is, we've found this as practitioners problematic is because we know that ICE has discretion to release people um, from these facilities on alternatives to detention, whether that be an ankle bracelet, maybe future check-ins with ICE, maybe they need to have telephonic check-ins, like they'll be called once a week. Um, these are all alternatives to detention that ICE could use and that they're not currently using. And we know that eight people have died in ICE custody and there's thousands who have tested positive um, with COVID-19 in, in the facilities that exist nationally. So trends in, in, in ICE activity. Um, we know that we, uh, in, in July of 2017, um, this, uh, sorry, January of 2017, that we moved away from targeted enforcement. The Obama era basically brought in secure communities and there were priorities. We were, po we were focusing on people who posed a danger to national security or a risk to public safety. And the Trump administration announced um, days within um, when they took office that really anybody who was convicted of any criminal offense or charged with any criminal offense could be detained and enforcement would basically um, happen in, to them. So somebody would uh, be arrested even if they have just a pending charge, um, which you know, as from a lawyer's point of view is incredibly problematic. We believe that people are innocent until proven guilty and that they should have the right to face these charges. And many times they don't have that chance because they are deported before they can ever face that criminal charge that's pending. Along with this national trends are certain people who are vulnerable populations that are no longer protected. So it was announced now that, you know, uh, for example, there used to be much more discretion around people and pregnant women, um, children, and um, that no longer exists. Um, we also know that um, immigration judges are being stripped of discretion to decide many um, of their cases. And I'm gonna talk about that right now, the reforms that we're seeing in the immigration courts and how they're impacting the cases that we litigate down in Chicago and the clients that we serve here in Dane County. So based on all of these um, policy changes and procedures. Definitely, we're starting to see immigration court as a tool 
for enforcement. So instead of being this neutral, um, objective place where people go to have their voices heard to get their case heard, we're definitely seeing very one-sided um, uh, cases be decided on very uh, one-sided issues. So um, there's definitely been a shift away from prosecutorial discretion. So in the past, the Department of Homeland Security and ICE attorneys, they had the ability to say, we are not going to move forward with this case at this time. We know that this person has been arrested. We know that they've also, for example, lived here for a very long time. We know that they have five US citizen children. Um, and so we are not gonna move forward with prosecuting this case. And the case is closed um, or terminated and it's sent out of the immigration court. Um, that ability was taken away from the Department of Homeland Security any communication that practitioners were able to have in the past with ICE attorneys about closing a case or even presenting a case as to why you shouldn't move forward um, with deporting this individual, the, all of those lines of communication were completely closed um, in 2017. And now that's caused a backlog of over 1 million cases. So what that means is that there's these millions of this million cases are being heard in, in these immigration courts. Um, there's 69 immigration courts and 465 judges, and we have 1 million cases currently pending. And so it's really become um, very difficult um, for individuals to find and seek justice um, because they're waiting years to just be heard um, on, on their case and be able to present their cases. And when it takes years to be able to do that, there's a lot of hindrances to be able to present your case. And you start to also build a life here in the United States. Um, and at the same time, are very vulnerable to the fact that that could be taken away from you at any moment when you're finally before that immigration judge in the immigration court. There's also been a loss of immigration judge discretion. Um, before immigration judges could decide that because somebody might have a path to relief or they have a, a potential path to relief that they were going to close this case. They were going to um, not hear, you know, have anybody come back in the future or at least in the immediate future. They were going to wait and, and watch how this case played out um, with before, for example, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, um, which is a different branch. We're going to wait to see how it's handled by them and then we'll come back and we will decide how to move forward, you know, in, in EOIR. And that's not happening anymore. So it increases the backlog and it also takes away that autonomy from immigration judges. Something that a lot of people don't know is that immigration court is housed in the executive office for immigration review within the Department of Justice. So the Department of Justice actually houses, right, EOIR. And that means that all of these immigration judges, their boss is the attorney general. So these immigration judges, right, um, are not article, a part of Article One, um, uh, uh, Article One branch, what is our independent courts, right? They are not an independent court. Um, they are housed within the Department of Justice. And part of our reforms as practitioners is calling for an independent immigration court so that immigration judges have more control over their caseloads and there's less control coming down from the Department of Justice on how their cases are handled. Part of that um, kind of handholding of DOJ is them implement, implementing case quotas and timelines. And so that means, for example, I appeared in front of a judge um, a few months ago and he was like, well, you know, this case has been going on for too long. We need to make a decision. Something needs to happen now. Um, and a lot of it had to do with a code that he was going to put in to his um, computer about what happened that day at our hearing. So instead of allowing for more time, especially in light of the possibility that this person could win their case or there's some sort of relief available, they're being asked to close cases as fast as possible. So essentially deport people as quickly as possible. We also know that um, recently they have hired many 
um, new immigration judges. Many of them are past ICE attorneys, so former prosecutors, so individuals who work for the Department of Homeland Security, who are career prosecutors, career ICE attorneys, become immigration judges. And we definitely see um, that their experience is primarily as a prosecutor from the bench. Um, and it's, um, it, they make the cases more difficult to litigate and often see things from the one side that they were trained to see it from. Um, which is from the side of the prosecution. One other tool for enforcement definitely that's happened most recently is that EOIR has prematurely reopened non-detained courts during the COVID-19 pandemic. So people who were detained continued to have their immigration courts, attorneys were encouraged to appear remotely, and a lot of this had to do with the fact that people were, you know, their liberty was restrained they were in detention. We had to continue to hold hearings to try and get them out. But those people who are not detained, those people who are living with their families, um, for example, here in the state of Wisconsin, who are working, who are essential workers, who had future court dates, those courts reopened. Um, and people are now having to go down to Chicago or even appear remotely um, via telephone. But the safety is not so much the issue, it's the issue that EOIR has placed their essential workers and judges um, at risk by reopening so that they can continue to deport people. It's not so much to continue to give people relief, but so they can continue to remove people and meet those case quotas and meet those timelines. Um, despite the fact that, for example, Chicago EOIR is located in an office building where you have to take one small elevator up to the fifth floor. Um, it's, it, it's very difficult to socially distance in those types of facilities and in those courtrooms. So um, it's been uh, very disappointing to see how EOIR has handled um, the reopening of the immigration courts. So I'll finish up by talking about some good news, <laughs> which we don't get a lot of, right? Um, in, inside of um, immigration and immigration law, um, as, as we can see, um, individuals um, who are detained by the Department of Homeland Security, many may not know, um, don't have the right to a government funded lawyer, like you do in criminal proceedings, for example. And so we at the Community Immigration Law Center offer something called universal representation. And we hope that this opens up an avenue for reform, particularly locally, because we do put the onus on our local officials to fund this as a public defender type system. And so what we do is we represent anybody who is a resident of our county um, and who qualifies financially, regardless of any other factors, like their criminal history, their immigration history, um, or the strength of their case, we take their cases um, and we present them before the immigration judges in Chicago. And <clears throat> we should know that, um, you know, these are cases that are very high stakes. Individuals who are before immigration judges are running the risk of losing everything that they have built here in the United States. Um, and they are, are so also, when we're in detention, they, their liberty is restrained. And so they go into these immigration courts um, without an attorney, and they go up against a trained um, prosecutor, like the ICE attorney, and they're before an immigration judge, and they're all alone trying to navigate these proceedings. Um, and we know that um, that even as immigrate, even as immigration lawyers, it's a very difficult scene to be in. It's a very hard thing to um, maneuver all of these legal standards, and yet we're expecting people to do that on their own when they're experiencing detention, when they're experiencing sometimes depression, maybe some mental health issues, they've been separated from their families, and now they're being asked to fight for their lives before an immigration judge. So universal representation, as we offer it here in Dane County, is the notion that every person who is at risk of deportation should have access to an immigration attorney, regardless of whether or not they can afford it. So why do we do this? Why do we implement universal representation? And why are we seeing it grow nationally um, uh, in different jurisdictions? 
Um, it's because of people, it, it works, as it says here. Um, and I'm gonna talk more about the numbers. Um, here in Dane County, we've represented 96 clients, um, 91 children that have been impacted by the work that we've done. 78% um, of people who are eligible for a bond have been released um, and are back in our communities. And 39% of our cases that we've taken to completion, that means that an immigration judge has decided and not all of our cases are closed. We talked about the backlogs. Our clients who have been released are now experiencing those backlogs where they're not back in immigration court yet. So they don't have a final answer as to what's gonna happen in their case. But those cases that we have completed, we've been successful 39% of the time, and that's compared with a 3% national success rate for people who represent themselves in immigration court. And our partners at the Immigrant Justice Clinic at the UW Law School have um, served over 700 people um, at the Dodge County facility during the year 2019. So I just, I put up my um, email and uh, our website from the Community Immigration Law Center. And I'm sure that right now it's time probably to take questions. So thank you very much, Aisa. Uh, one, thank you uh, for the work you're doing. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, also, thank you very much for ending on a somewhat high note. Um, uh, so that was, uh, uh, I think, a useful way to round that out. Um, so I will start with uh, some of the questions that came in um, in the Q&A box. And again, for those of you um, I haven't noticed there is a tab that says Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You, know, you may just have to scroll over it for, to get it to pop up. So I will start with the questions that are there. Um, and then uh, if obviously as more come in, I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to, uh, so let me start with a few that came in. Uh, I'll start with Jen's. Um, a couple questions that came in uh, were essentially about uh, favor, favorability bias. Um, so at least the first two comments came in saying, uh, they were surprised at the relatively positive views. So, uh, you had given us some public opinion data, uh, showing that, uh, quite a few, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was, it was, uh, certainly a super majority. I thought you said something like 70%, you know, had relatively positive views of immigrants. I don't remember exactly how that question was worded, but we had uh, at least a couple of comments asking. Um, you know, is, is this essentially a favor, favorability bias, right? Are these people who, um, so can you talk a little bit about it? I mean, this is an issue more broadly in polling, but can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, to the extent, um, is this public opinion actually, uh, uh, reflecting the mood of the country or is this people trying to kind hearted when they're talking with an interviewer over the phone? So if maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I can talk um, just in really broad strokes about this. Uh, and it is, yeah, it is a methods concern and it's something that pollsters worry about. Um, and it's something they call social desirability bias. And in fact, our, our methods team at Pew Research Center contributed to a 2016 election postmortem uh, report and study uh, to study whether shy, quote unquote, shy Trump voters skewed the polls before the election. Um, but, but they found little evidence of, of this. They, they found that it was more likely that uh, Trump voters just broke late toward the candidate. Um, so unfortunately, I'm, I've not been a part of those studies. I'm, I'm not a methodologist, but I can't say that in general, all in all, we're, we're confident in our findings about how U.S. adults view immigrants and immigration policies. Um, and I can, uh, for anyone who's really wanting to geek out on uh, methodology, I can send a link to the postmortem. That's great. And Jens, while, while we're here, uh, there was another question that came in um, from Patrick McNamara. Um, that asked about um, TPS, so temporary protected status. Um, uh, essentially, what are the options? Uh, here's how the question, um, oh, excuse me, has Pew polled views on TPS? And then, excuse me, and then this question is for the rest of the group. What options are available for TPS holders after their status ends? Uh, what would you like to see happen regarding TPS in terms of creating new options? So maybe 
Jens, if you can ask about if there's public opinion on TPS, then maybe um, Aisa, maybe uh, you could talk a little bit about some of the, I suspect that this is a somewhat uh, nuanced and difficult legal question. So maybe you can just wait in there as well. Yeah, and I, my apologies, I, I had, um, didn't address the other question about the quote unquote perception gap, which is interesting and, and worth studying, but we haven't really dug into that. And, um, it's kind of tricky. You have to figure out how people view certain issues. Um, but it is worth noting that depending on, on how you see things, you, you could see uh, this perception gap on other issues like climate change and the Electoral College. And I will send links to our research on that here. And then so switching to the TPS, fortunately, we haven't done any polling on TPS, uh, but it's possible that uh, other firms have. I haven't looked. Okay, thank you. Aisa, um, there's a couple questions that came in for you. If you want to start with this issue of TPS, um, weigh in as much as you, you know, to, to the extent uh, you can. And then um, there's a couple other questions that came in. I'll get to that next. Sure. So, um, so people with TPS, um, definitely after their status ends, it's difficult to say um, what options they have. Technically, they have no other option. Technically, they need to prepare to return back to their home country. Um, but in certain circuits, I think particularly the sixth and ninth circuit, um, USCIS might consider um, uh, uh, somebody with TPS as being admitted under the immigration laws. And that means if they've, for example, um, married somebody um, who has um, citizenship, they might be able to um, adjust their status um, as, as being admitted into the country. But that's limited, um, if I'm correct, currently into the sixth and ninth circuits. Um, but other than that, unfortunately, um, when TPS ends, basically the U.S. is saying um, we, we no longer consider your home country to be a, um, a place that, you know, might be in, in turmoil and um, you, you know, should prepare yourself to return to your home country. So, perfect. Thank you so much, Aisa. Um, and then there's uh, two questions that came in and I'll actually weigh in on one uh, and I'll let you. So, one of them asks, so uh, Bert asks, um, um, thanks for sharing the research regarding ICE detentions. Um, do you have a sense of the percentage of detainees who are in uh, private for-profit facilities? So I can weigh in. So actually, I, when I, the question came in, I did a little bit of internet sleuthing. So in 2017, uh, it looks like about 70% of immigrants were, uh, detainees were held in private facilities. Um, uh, so just a, so seven zero. And again, if there's an update, that was in, F, that was in fiscal year 2017. Um, and, uh, so I don't know, I'm sure there's some more updated figures. I couldn't find them in the interim of this conversation. I used to please correct me. I don't think there's any detainees held in private facilities in Wisconsin, but please correct me if that is the case. I do believe it's Dodge and Kenosha, which are essentially they're renting out the, the county jail space. Um, but please, uh, correct me. And then let me just put a, a pin in that. And then. Um, Jennifer Collins asks, can permanent residents charged with crimes be deported? Has this increased under the Trump administration? So um, if you could weigh in a little bit about that, I know, again, it's probably a more nuanced question than just yes, no. I'm sure it depends on the crime committed. Um, but please, uh, we would love to hear your expertise here. Yes, um, Dr. Light. So you're right. The two facilities here in Wisconsin and then currently the only one being used is a Dodge County facility and ICE contracts with the counties. Um, and so the counties receive money per bed filled. Um, and currently there's about 200 beds in um, the Dodge facility. Numbers, again, they're down. Um, we're used to seeing a number of asylum seekers uh, from the border transported up to the Dodge County facility. And because um, currently the, the borders are essentially shut down, we're not seeing the same numbers. Um, but we still have um, many people in that facility who have been detained by ICE locally here in Wisconsin. Um, as far as lawful permanent residents, so people with a green card, right, they have the permission, permission to be here in the United States. Um, sometimes they're working towards citizenship. They can be deported, and it does depend um, on, on the type of crime. Um, and the only protection currently against deportation is citizenship. And so we always encourage people who are green card holders to become citizens. It protects you from deportation, and you're able to register to vote. 
Um, but yes, people with green cards, um, even doesn't matter how long they've been here, um, just holding that LPR status does make you vulnerable to deportation if you do commit a certain crime. And Aisa, could you, uh, again, I don't know if you've been able to see again, I didn't, I wasn't sure off the top of my head. I know that, um, you know, arrests, I know adjudications, and I know that deportations have been increasing the past few years. They had been tracking down and now they're up pretty, pretty substantially. Certainly arrests are. Um, I know that the immigration courts have ground uh, to a halt in many places, um, but can you weigh in? Do you have a sense uh, if LPRs have been um, targeted more in the Trump administration or if it's been, if, if there's, you know, do you, do you have a sense of that? That was the second follow up uh, to that oh, question. Sure. I, I don't, I don't have a sense of it. I know that um, we've seen an increase, like I talked about earlier, of people who have pending charges, not necessarily LPRs. People usually who are undocumented with pending charges, which we've seen as problematic uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, but uh, I can't say for sure whether there's been an increase in um, prosecuting and um, trying to deport individuals with green cards. Um, it does depend a lot on their criminal history and background. Um, but we do see um, an uptick in enforcement in other general areas and people who have been removed before. We also know the people who had green cards uh, from Laos, for example, who were previously deported and the Hmong population, we've seen them come back around and say, hey, um, you know, I think we're going to try and deport you. So because we've seen an uptick in enforcement everywhere, I wouldn't doubt it, but I can't, you can't quote me on that because I'm not sure of the numbers. Thank you. And actually, Aisa, I have one last follow-up just because this number is um, fascinating to me. So um, you can talk a little bit about this. I'll briefly, I, mean, the, I think we can generally talk about um, immigration court as having uh, really two separate worlds. We have the detained and non-detained docket, um, which almost function, you know, um, they really seem to be almost separate entities at this point. Um, the detained docket tends to move quicker, perhaps not quick, but it certainly goes faster. Can you just give us a sense of how far out you are uh, scheduling the non you know, some of your non-detained clients? Could you, because again, I, I know you, we've talked about this before, but I haven't gotten a more recent update that was pre-COVID. So I'm just curious if you could talk about that briefly. Sure. So um, I'll be interested to see where I'm put after these, th th this fall, all of my hearings have been, have been uh, pushed out. Um, and so um, it's going to be interesting to see where those individuals are going to be placed eventually. But um, right now, my furthest case out um, has been set for April of 2023. Um, and that is for a, a man who is a green card holder um, who is fighting to keep his green card. Um, he is um, an older, he's an elderly man um, in his late 70s. Um, and uh, that family unfortunately will be kind of in this space of vulnerability until we get an answer in 2023. Okay, thank you. Yes, so I, I, I thought that the number would be around there, but I, you know, like I said, every, every time I hear it, it's still always um, fairly staggering. Um, there was one, and, and so again, somebody please let me know if I've missed something. There was, um, uh, Let's see, Jen's responded here. Uh, Stanislav asked a question that I responded briefly to one part of it. Um, he uh, asked, he says, thousands of asylum seekers in the U.S. Are, are not allowed to travel abroad while awaiting their interviews, which could be up to 10 years. They have jobs, they pay taxes, they're stuck in the U.S. through no fault of the, this backlog. He says, what is the political legal nature of this limitation on freedom and is it constitutional? So one, can you maybe just talk about, do you have a sense of what those restrictions are for people who have applied for asylum? Um, and then just maybe just give us a sense of, you know, how you counsel your clients. Um, and, uh, yeah, maybe just talk a little bit about that, but, you know, be as specific or as broad as you would like, Aisa. So I think I couldn't, I didn't see the question, um, but I'll try so it's, to Yeah. So if you look, if you tap on the Q and A and go to go to the answered section, um, oh. cause I replied, yeah, sorry. So the, I, I had to learn this as well. Cause I was, I thought I like deleted the comment, but so it's point two here. Um, okay. 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 Uh, now it's about as well. Yeah. Okay. I see. Um, so, so yes, um, it, asylum seekers are not allowed to travel abroad. I think that that's part of that reason is just that they're availing themselves to the United States for protection. Um, and so we're saying, you know, you, you, you cannot leave, um, 
because until there's a decision on your case and, and no it's not it's not fair <laughs> um, uh, but it's something and it's something that they are very serious about um, and we want to make sure as far as counseling them that they're not abandoning these asylum applications um, you know while they're pending so um, currently you know we know that at the our most southern border um, we have Title 42 under the U.S. Code currently enacted, so individuals are not able to seek asylum currently here in the United States. They're quickly being expelled. This includes unaccompanied minors, so children are also um, who, who are seeking asylum are being quickly expelled either to Mexico or to their home country, mostly Central American unaccompanied minors. So it's a very difficult situation at the border. Um, definitely my colleague Aaron Barbado at the Immigrant Justice Clinic has done a lot with asylum seekers at the border. And you know that's where I started my career was back home in um, Harlingen, Texas. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a very difficult situation and we're definitely seeing the number of asylum seekers in the United States go down. And um, I think that's important incredibly problematic for um, human rights. So two things. One, shout out to Aaron, who I believe is in attendance. Um, so Aaron, thank you for being here. Aaron runs the uh, Immigrant Justice Clinic here at the University of Wisconsin Law School. Um, so I also just saw in the uh, chat here um, that uh, Patrick McNamara, uh, who is also an attorney, says I have two cases scheduled for 2024 and 11 for 2023. So obviously this is not something unique to us. This is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is the the not particularly the the non-detained docket is is really ground to a, a, a incredible halt. Um, the backlog is really quite staggering. So uh, I think we're increasingly cognizant of people's time. Uh, we're running up against. Um, um, okay, thank you. Oh, sorry, Patrick. The, thank you for that clarification. I'm a country conditions expert uh, for Mexico, uh, not an attorney. So thank you for that clarification. Um, so um, uh, one, uh, let me uh, just, uh, I'm happy to, if the panelists have any further comments or any closing, if you have any closing arguments, um, uh, we're happy to hear again. Um, uh, I'm, I'll, I'll speak on behalf of certainly uh, those organizers, but I think in, uh, as well as the attendees, we really appreciate your uh, time today. Um, really a great uh, a collection of panelists. Like I said, I, I'm really glad about how this came together in terms of the various aspects we were able to discuss. So if there's no further questions um, or if there's no further comments, again, on behalf of everyone, I just want to say thank you to Isabel, thank you to Aisa, and thank you to Jens for being here um, and taking time out of your day. I know you guys, I, ever, I know all of you are very, very busy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Light. Yeah, thank you so much. I really thank you as well. It. Yeah, you did a great job, Dr. Light. <gasps> I, I, I didn't do anything, so thank you. <laughs> and I wanted to say thank you to all the participants, and uh, we will see you next week. <laughs>